Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we went over the first half of what's called the vestibular apparatus. We talked about the two organs of the vestibule, which are the utricle and the saccule. And we saw that the utricle and saccule are involved in detecting changes in static equilibrium, uh, that is, head flexion and head extension relative to your head upright, and changes in linear acceleration. Now remember what linear acceleration is. That's like if you get in your car and you start from rest and slam on the gas and you start going from 0 to 60 miles an hour in like 4 seconds, you're obviously accelerating. Likewise, you could also be at 60 miles per hour, slam on the brakes, and then it takes you down to zero and you're decelerating. So the utricle and saccule are both involved in detection of those processes, okay? And please go back and watch that video if you need more on that. Now we need to talk about rotational equilibrium. And rotational equilibrium, or changes in it, involve the function of the semicircular canals. Now remember, when we talked about the vestibule, the vestibule was only the utricle and the saccule. If we talk about the vestibular apparatus as a whole, the vestibular apparatus is basically the vestibule, utricle and saccule, plus three semicircular canals. And it's important to note there's three. The first one is called the anterior or superior semicircular canal. Then we have the lateral semicircular canal, and then what's called the posterior semicircular canal. And these three semicircular canals detect changes in rotational equilibrium in one of the three planes. Okay, that is the transverse plane, the coronal or frontal plane, and then also the sagittal plane. And lucky for us, the semicircular canals are actually going to function very similarly to the autolithic organs of the vestibule, that is the saccule and the utricle. Now, if we look at each of these three canals, notice that they each have this engorgement called the ampulla. For example, there's an ampulla of the anterior semicircular canal, there's an ampulla of all three of them. And contained within the ampulla, we have a structure that's very similar to the autolithic organs. Okay? But instead, it's called a cupula. A cupula is a fancy word for a dome. And this yellow structure right here, this is called a cupula. So if we were at rotational equilibrium, we were not rotating at all, this would basically be, ju this would basically be just standing still. No rotation. Then this is what your cupula basically looks like. And it sits right in the ampulla of that semicircular canal. It's surrounded by this fluid. Underneath the cupula, we have this layer of cells, this is this tissue, and in this tissue we have hair cells, just like we did in the autolithic organs. These hair cells on one side have cilia, the cilia actually sits inside the cupula, right? And on the other side we have axons, and these axons are ultimately going to converge with sensory nerve fibers that lead to the vestibular nerve, okay? In fact, it pretty much is set up the same way as what we saw in the autolithic organs, okay? Except the structures are slightly different. And so you could imagine that if we have this fluid moving either left or right, that fluid is gonna move the cupula in the same direction. So for example, if the fluid moved toward the right, then the cupula is gonna be pushed toward the right, and that's gonna cause these hair cells to be pushed toward the right. And that's going to cause changes in the firing rate of these axons that lead ultimately to the vestibular nerve. Okay? Likewise, if the fluid moved toward the left, everything's going to be reversed. The cupula is going to be moved toward the left. These hair cells, or the cilia of them, are going to be moved toward the left. And again, we're going to have differences in the firing rates of these axons that lead ultimately toward the vestibular nerve. Now here's an example of what happens when we actually have rotation. So this right here is basically the direction of the rotation. So if the direction of the rotation, and we might actually say this would be clockwise, we can't really say left or right because it's rotation, but if we say that this is clockwise, then the direction of the flow of the fluid is in the opposite direction, so counterclockwise. That's important to understand. The direction of the rotation is always opposite the direction of the flow of the fluid within the canal. Okay, But in any case, 
if we rotate, let's say, clockwise, then the fluid is going to relatively move counterclockwise. And if this is the counterclockwise direction, it's going to move the cupola in that direction. And also it's going to move the cilia of the hair cells in that direction, which leads to changes in firing of these axons. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. Now let's look at an actual example. This is actually specifically going to be the lateral semicircular canal, or also called the horizontal semicircular canal. And as we'll see later, the lateral or horizontal semicircular canal detects rotations in the transverse plane. So if you rotated your head around to look to the right and to the left, this is basically what you do when you shake your head no. Right? You rotate it left and right, that's in the transverse plane. This particular semicircular canal is going to detect that movement. And so notice what's happening here in the resting position. This would just be anatomical position. You're still no movement whatsoever. Notice the cupola is not being moved in either direction. The endolymph, which is actually this fluid inside the canal, is not moving. And we have a baseline level cupula response, exactly the same way we had a baseline level utricle and saccule response. It's called tonic or resting activity. All right. But notice if we rotate the head to the right, so this would be looking toward your right, there is an acceleration that's detected. And so whenever you rotate your head to the right, the endolymph for that fluid, which is this fluid right here in red, is going to move in the opposite direction. And notice what happens, it moves the cupola, at least here in this picture, toward the right. Okay, And so that's going to translate to excitation. Okay. However, notice what happens when we have head rotation to the left, the opposite direction. The endolymph also moves in the opposite direction, and it moves the cupula in the opposite direction. And so depending on which direction the cupula moves, you either have excitation, which is a faster firing rate, or inhibition, a slower firing rate of those axons. Now, most likely in an anatomy course, you won't have to know which one is which, excitation or inhibition. But the important thing to notice is that depending on which direction the cupula is moved, you either have a faster firing rate or the opposite, a slower firing rate. And that's pretty much the function of all three semicircular canals. Now, the only other thing that I want to make sure to go over is really these specific semicircular canals. We've already mentioned that the lateral, also called the horizontal semicircular canal, this is the canal that detects movements of the head in the transverse plane. So that's if you shake your head no or look left to right. If we talk about the anterior or the superior, as it's called, semicircular canal, this is going to detect movements in the sagittal plane. So this would be consecutive neck flexions and extensions, basically nodding yes. So looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up, that's a movement of the head in the sagittal plane, and that's going to cause rotation of the fluid through the anterior or superior semicircular canal. And then the last one is the posterior semicircular canal. This one's kind of oblique. It's angular relative to the other two. And so as a result, this is going to detect rotational movements in the other plane, and the only other one is the frontal or coronal plane. And so to stimulate the posterior semicircular canal, you'd have to move your head, rotate it, such that your right ear touches your right shoulder, and your left ear touches your left shoulder and back and forth. Okay, um, no, Not really a better way to describe that unless you want to talk about lateral neck flexion. Okay? But that's movement in the frontal plane, and that's going to be activating the posterior semicircular canal. And again, notice in all three of those cases, there is rotation. Okay? And so for that reason, the semicircular canals are going to detect changes in rotational equilibrium. And finally, ultimately, these signals from all three of these semicircular canals, along with signals from the utricle and saccule, are going to be sent through the vestibular nerve, which is going to connect with the cochlear nerve and ultimately become the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve number eight. And that pretty much concludes this video. Personally, I think the semicircular canals are a little bit easier to learn than the utricle and the saccule. Let me know what you think in the comments. Other than that, I hope you learned a lot here. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next couple of videos, we're going to go over some of the more basic primitive senses, and that's going to be olfaction and gustation. Please join me then.